Mark, welcome to our uh, series. Um, Mark is was a former um, executive, human resources executive, and he changed careers. And, and when he changed careers, he had a lot lifelong interest in fishing and hunting. And so he, in his retirement, combined it to become a certified master wildlife conservationist. And he goes around and he presents these educational programs like we're going to listen to today to uh, people in um, the state. And he talks about the wildlife for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environment Protection. And Mark began his beekeeping on his family's farm in New Hampshire, which is pretty cool. And in uh, 2012, he became the state apiary inspector. I don't know if you have a bee hat on, Mark, or not. Um, you no, I have a agricultural experiment station hat on. Okay, today. so that's where he works in New Haven. And so we get a little uh, advertising there. And he is responsible for licensing honeybee apiaries and monitoring the health of the Connecticut uh, bees in our state. Um, so I'm not going to spend any more time. I'm going to let him take over. And without further ado, here you are. Be here now. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Creighton. And I am uh, a master beekeeper and also the state uh, bee inspector. And I work at the Connecticut uh, Agricultural Experiment Station uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. And I was very fortunate. I mean, I heard uh, of someone else's career path took a little bit of a turn. And my background actually is in law enforcement and nursing. So figure how those two intersect and actually they do with this job. And so uh, I just retired from, uh, from a police department here in Connecticut after uh, I believe 30, 33 total years of service. Uh, and I was in the United States Coast Guard. What a wonderful experience. I was in during the, the first Gulf War and uh, I was a, a nurse paramedic and they would uh, put me in a helicopter and send me out to sea and I would do things and hopefully people got better. And uh, those experiences helped me get to the job that I'm at today. And so uh, a lot of what I do as uh, a bee inspector is I uh, assist beekeepers by diagnosing problems with their hives. And those problems could be uh, viral in nature or bacterial or uh, management issues. And so uh, I'm able to help uh, Connecticut's beekeepers in uh, keeping their uh, honeybee stocks uh, healthy and out there pollinating and doing all that wonderful stuff. Now, I was thinking about this presentation today and it dawned on me. Yeah, I know it took over 11 years before it dawned on me that Perhaps uh, folks don't know what an agricultural experiment station is. And, uh, and so I thought I'd just share for a second uh, some information about what an agricultural experiment station is. And um, there are a research center that investigates in difficult or potential improvements in, our, in food production and agribusiness. Each state has uh, an agricultural experiment station. They were formed quite a long time ago, actually. And they started with the Hatch Act of, I believe, 1857. And in Connecticut, we have the distinction of being the very first agricultural experiment station in the nation. And uh, that's when we were first formed there was a request to the Connecticut legislature to support some agricultural research. And at that time, uh, our organization was actually on the campus of Wesleyan University. And after a very short term there, uh, we moved to Yale University and we were on uh, their campus for uh, five or six years before we purchased property and now are located on Huntington Street in New Haven, Connecticut on the former Eli Whitney estate. And so that is our base uh, research facility. 
and we have uh, a research farm in Griswold, Connecticut, along with uh, Windsor, and also in Hamden, Connecticut. And uh, we are principally funded uh, by the state of Connecticut at, at approximately 60%. And because we are an agricultural experiment station, we receive 40% uh, ish of our funding through the federal government, through the Hatch Act. And, uh, and our goal is to uh, uh, discover new and innovative techniques and, and solutions to agricultural problems so that we can uh, ensure that our food systems are secure and bountiful and and it's a wonderful place to work. Now, when I first, I did not know about agricultural experiment stations some time ago. And uh, I separated from active duty in the United States Coast Guard. And as was mentioned earlier, I did grow up on a small uh, itty bit farm in New Hampshire. And we had a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I was not very successful with beekeeping. On separation from active duty after, uh, nearly 12 years uh, with the Coast Guard. I finished my service in the reserve actually in New Haven. Um, I was a little disappointed when I was on active duty. The Coast Guard wouldn't allow me to put a beehive on a Coast Guard cutter. I, I just couldn't understand it. But uh, nonetheless, uh, on separating from uh, active duty, I was able to start out with uh, a couple of beehives and my family thought I was crazy. And uh, I studied it for a while and two hives became four and then eight and then 16 and it was just out of control. And so I studied a lot and uh, I was at a bee meeting in fact in New Haven some 11 years ago. And during this meeting, uh, one of the uh, researchers uh, got up and said, oh, by the way, uh, the station here has an opening for an apiary inspector. And in the bee world, in a bee community, that is the pinnacle of your life in the, in the in bee world. And uh, so he spoke and I said, wow, I would love that job. But it sounds, you know, so many people would be more qualified than I. I almost didn't even apply for it. And so uh, I did apply for it. And I had shared with my uh, wife, I said, if you get an envelope in the mail from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Do me, a, do me a favor, don't tell me about it. Just put it on the uh, bureau. And uh, my experience had always been seeking and, and applying for federal jobs or state jobs that your declination letter always comes, you know, in an envelope and rarely do folks call you. And so the letter came and I, oh, well, you know, I tried and, uh, Probably two weeks later, uh, I got an unexpected phone call from Dr. Kirby Stafford, who is the state entomologist. And he said, Mark, what's up? I sent you a letter. I wanted to uh, set up an interview for this position. And I'm like, duh, hmm. So we got that interview set up. And to my surprise, uh, they, they thought that I would be a good candidate. So then they brought me down to, uh, to New Haven, said, oh, we have a couple people that uh, need to interview you first before we can make a decision on this. And I'm like, okay, and who are these people? And all of those people, there were uh, five or six of them, all had PhD behind their name. And I thought, I was never trained to you know, sit for an interview like this, let alone an interview process that lasted all day long with uh, all of these folks. It ended up with uh, one of our, our best directors who, uh, who was the last interview and he, uh, he offered me the job. And so I am very thankful uh, to have this job to represent beekeepers uh, and bee clubs in the state of Connecticut and, and hope to play some small role in overall bee health uh, for Connecticut bees and beekeepers. And so uh, in the course of taking on these duties. I did take three years and get my master beekeeper certification from the University of Montana. And uh, that's what uh, got me here today to give some talk. 
Now, sometimes when I uh, make a presentation, I take, I take some turns. And some of you may ask, well, what does this have to do with bees or beekeeping? But trust me, I will pull it all together and it'll all make sense uh, at some point, I think. No, I'm pretty sure it will. And so uh, the first uh, slide that uh, I have to offer is this slide that says, who discovered America? And I know when I was a kid, uh, I was told that uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America. And uh, it took me a while to figure out that uh, probably that did not happen. Probably he discovered Hispaniola uh, and well, who discovered America. And so research suggests perhaps that uh, North America was discovered uh, many years before Christopher Columbus decided to sail across the ocean blue. Um, Leif uh, Erikson is probably uh, attributed to discovering North America, landed uh, somewhere perhaps up in Canada. However, some uh, others suggest that perhaps it was this other guy, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. He was also an explorer. He never left his ship, but in both instances with Leif, er Leif Erikson uh, and this other fellow, they were blown off course. They were going between like Greenland and Iceland and a bad storm came up and all of a sudden, oh, what's this land over here? And so uh, the first gentleman did not make landfall. However, he told Leif Erikson about it, who was an explorer. And uh, he was also a Christian, by the way. And that's really why he was out on a boat because he was going to spread Christianity throughout that region. And uh, he heard this discussion about this new land uh, that was eventually su highly suggested that it was probably Newfoundland in Canada because they subsequently found a Norse settlement there. And Leaf called it Vineland because of all the vines and all the grapes and everything. And so I have this slide here for to represent you can't always believe what you read, even in a textbook, and you have to use your own curiosity, your own exploration, your own research in order to come up with, I think, factual information. And this is always a problem in the beekeeping world, that's for sure. And so on this next slide, uh, how old are honeybees? And I, I like to get people thinking about this. And honeybees, have been on this, this planet for a very long time. A lot of people just haven't had an opportunity to uh, explore or research how long they've been here. And uh, it's 110 million years, at least, roundabout. And boy, that's a long time. Um, and so we know that because of this one fossil that was discovered uh, a long time ago in amber, and they were able to uh, carbon date it. And then I have often heard in my interactions with beekeepers and bee researchers, and I've often heard uh, in this area that I work in that, you know, bees are in, you know, invasive uh, insects, you know, they really shouldn't be here. And they are depopulating our native bees and, and doing all kinds of damage. And in researching some of this, I discovered that, you know, we have a lot of invasive things and some aren't good at all. Trust me, I know that. But some invasive plants or insects are pretty beneficial to us, actually. And, um, and so for those that think that uh, honeybees are invasive insects, I, I can think about first off uh, an invasive plant or an invasive tree that's not native to uh, the United States or North America. And that's the apple tree. And so apple trees are not native to our land, but boy, where would we be today without apples? And so uh, I had to live with this uh, this thought that uh, honeybees were invasive and they're, it's not natural for them to be in uh, North America. And all the textbooks said that, some of them still say it today, except in 2009 uh, in Utah, we discovered a fossilized honeybee. And, uh, and so that 
should, and there's a, a actual copy of it. I forgot that I put these pictures in here. And so this uh, honeybee is uh, from a native bee, native honeybee in Utah and in what is now the United States of America. And so honeybees were here before and they were reintroduced probably in the 1640s uh, when the settlers came over. And the other interesting thing that I have learned is that our first real beekeepers were the Egyptians. And they, they actually, and prior to that time, our relationship with bees was probably not a healthy relationship because we kind of just exploited them. Oh, wow, don't we do that today? Uh, we'll come back to that. But we were uh, interested in that, uh, that sweet honey and we would uh, destroy their hives and poke sticks in there and, and get a sweet reward. And then we decided that we could just pilferage honey from bees for a long time. And I guess we, in a way we still are. And so uh, Egyptians were the first uh, groups of people to actually manage bees and move bees around. And they were, uh, they understood bees and beekeeping. They understood pollination. They didn't call it pollination, but they certainly did a lot of things that we would call pollination today. And so the, uh, the Nile River in Egypt is very unique in that it flows in the opposite direction of most rivers. And they were able to take these bee colonies that they had, put them on barges and follow the bloom up the Nile and produce great quantities of honey. And that's pretty amazing. And uh, the Egyptians had enormous respect for bees, beekeeping honey, and bee products. And um, certainly honey was uh, uh, considered a food from the gods. They used honey for a number of other medicinal purposes. In fact, they discovered that honey was very important in the embalming process. And when we discovered uh, Tut's tomb many hundreds of years later, the honey vessels that were still uh, intact within the tomb contain edible honey. Eh, in the bits of hair and other bits that were in there, we'll disregard that. But honey lasts a long time, it doesn't spoil. And uh, it's the only insect that provides uh, a food source for humans. I have this, uh, this other slide on this. <clears throat> And I, I like everyone to remember a little bit, if they haven't had this experience before, uh, learning about Pangaea. And so once upon a time, uh, we had a singular landmass on this planet. <clears throat> and that's what it's guessed to have looked like. And you can see how we can put the pieces together. And we know that, uh, you know, over time, these continents divided. But I want to take you back to the first statement about bees in when they originated on this planet. And that was at least 110 million years ago. And at that time, we were still in this singular landmass. And so bees were born on this singular landmass. And another thing actually was born at that time too, because prior to this period of time that we're going to speak on briefly, we had a lot of green vegetation on our planet today. We had a lot of green vegetation on our planet then. We still have it today, but we call it something else. But all of the green stuff that grew for, for millions and millions and millions of years and layered for millions of years, uh, I guess nature got sick of the, uh, the green stuff. Uh, in order for the green stuff to be pollinated, uh, we used the wind and wind was very available, but the plants had to consume so much energy creating pollen and letting the wind blow the pollen across the land in order for pollination to happen. It just wasn't uh, efficient. And so mother nature decided that, what if we took all this green stuff and we made something colorful and smelly and beautiful. Angiosperms first showed up on this probably a hundred million years ago. And so mother nature said at that time too, wow, 
if we can get away from wind pollination, and we haven't done that 100%, but a lot, and we could convince the insects and the bees to do this pollination task for us, we could save a lot of energy and we could be more efficient in our pollination process. And so the plant world decided, well, we've got these um, hornets out there. We're going to uh, offer them up some uh, sweet nectar, a honey reward, well, not a honey reward, but a sweet nectar reward uh, to visit our plants. And uh, the bees initially were uh, carnivores. They were initially wasp-like creatures and they slowly changed their biology over to become vegetarian. And so these bees and plants evolved together over a hundred million years ago when we had this singular landmass. And so the plants became competitive too. I want more bees, so I'm gonna smell more beautiful than the other plant. No, but my plant's source is better, I'm gonna make uh, my nectar sweeter than your nectar. And, and so there was this competition that occurred and, uh, and the bees were uh, cohorsed into doing the bidding of the flowers by carrying the pollen from flower to flower. They changed the, uh, the wasp from a, from a meat eater to a, a vegetarian or a pollen eater. And that's pretty significant today because many of these facts still remain true after all these millions of years. And of course we know what happened with Pangaea. And so that is why we have different subspecies of honeybees on all these other continents. The honeybees are all related, but they have some peculiar differences that are based upon the environmental influences of their continent. And, um, and that's pretty amazing actually. And uh, then later in the uh, 1800s, it was decided that Apis mellifera uh, was the ideal uh, pollinator and honey producer for the world. And we discovered, you know, which we'll see in a little bit, uh, that we could put them in a box. And if we put them in a box, well, boxes can be shipped all over the uh, Northeast. They can be shipped all over the world. And yeah, that's what we did. And that has created some problems. But and so that's a little bit about uh, the history. And I always like to put this one up there. You know, how long have we been here? How long have we been on this earth? And uh, not that long. And so uh, I, I put that slide up there just to reinforce the fact that relative to bees, we're newcomers to this game. Uh, we probably don't think that way or that we are, but uh, you know, history suggests otherwise. And so uh, humans and bees, by the way, are very lucky. Um, we, we know about the last great extinction. Uh, actually, there were at least five others uh, in the history of the world. And um, the worst one, approximately 250 million years ago, 96% of marine species and 70% of land species died off. And it took a very long, long time to recover from that. And then I was shocked when I read that uh, of all these extinctions, 99% of all organisms that ever lived on this earth aren't here anymore. Fortunately, we are, and the bees are, and we're very lucky to have been that uh, 1% who, su who survived these, uh, these mass extinction uh, events. The last, of course, uh, is thought to have been a, a meteor, a very large media that uh, crashed into the, I believe the Gulf of Mexico and and it was at that time that uh, Apis near Atticus also became extinct. And so uh, Apis near Atticus, of course, is this uh, native honeybee uh, that was found in Utah. And so that's when we lost our, uh, our honeybees in North America. 
I'm often asked, why do you keep bees? They, they sting, you know? And so uh, in talking with so many people about bees, uh, many get into beekeeping uh, to help nature, uh, to pollinate a garden. Everyone wants a little honey. Many wanna learn about nature. Many discover accidentally the peace and tranquility that they can also get from keeping bees. And this surprises so many beekeepers. I try to mentor one beekeeper each year through the entire process. And, um, and the gentleman that I uh, mentored last year is in, uh, from Middle Haddam. And I mentioned this comment to him uh, earlier in our experiences that I said, you will be surprised one day when you take your coffee cup in the morning up to your beehive and you sit down in your chair and you drink your coffee and you start watching the bees. Oh, I'm never going to do that. I'll take my coffee up to the bee yard. Yeah, sure. Well, one day I came for my inspection and I noticed that uh, there were two chairs there and a little table. And he had even convinced his wife, who is not a beekeeper, to come up and share her coffee there too. And so they're just wonderful creatures to, to watch and to enjoy. And it causes me to think when I'm sitting there, I'm like, there's a beehive. And in that beehive, there are 60 to 100,000 insects. And 33% of those are flying out and foraging and and bringing in the things that they need to survive on this planet. And they bringing in nectar and pollen and water and, and propolis. And there are thousands of bees. And I never see a mid-air collision of those bees. And I'm thinking from my military experience, you know, how many people are on an aircraft carrier and how all those planes are so tightly controlled. And the bees have figured this out because I've never seen two bees crash into each other but i still wait and watch but uh you know they've been on this planet with us for a very long time and uh bees and flowers and coffee and honey they just all go together and it's certainly a wonderful uh experience to uh to partake in so uh honeybees are pretty unique because like us we're social social creatures they live in uh, nest cavities, and we have raised them in a box, but they really prefer to live in a tree, in the hollow of a tree, and that's where they are found in nature. And uh, it's pretty neat to uh, discover these uh, bees living in the wild, and you know we hope to try to get some genetics from them and help improve overall bee health. But most traditionally, you're going to see people keeping bees in a bee yard like this. And this was one of my bee yards in, uh, in East Haddam. And so um, this type of, you know, it's hard to move a tree if you're trying to do pollination. And we, we forgot our lessons with the Egyptians and then rediscovered uh, some of the techniques and things that they did later on, which is, I guess, kind of true with history. If we look back, we can rediscover things that we have forgotten about. And so now we uh, decided we could put bees in a, in a box. And if we can put them in a box and we can put them in a trailer, if we can put them in a trailer, we can move them with a truck and you know, how that story goes. And this was all possible because the Langstroth hive that we use today was based upon a discovery in uh, 1851, actually in Massachusetts, uh, by the Reverend Langstroth. And he discovered uh, what is called the uh, bee space. And bee space is that a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch where the frames, if they're that far apart, the bees won't just seize them all together. And if they seized them all together, you couldn't take the frames out and extract the honey or take the frames out and examine them for disease. And so by that simple discovery, uh, we were able to create a box and put frames in the box with appropriate bee space so that the bees wouldn't fuse it all into one solid wax mass 
And so we could then manage our bees, we could manage disease, we could uh, remove it for honey. And in this picture, actually, we have uh, two types of hives. And so these Langstroth box uh, look like this, but in this one, I actually have another type of hive and that's a, a top bar hive. And we're gonna talk just a little bit more about that top bar hive because that's probably more common beekeeping system in the world uh, than this Langstroth box. And so um, here in Connecticut, these are the types of hives that I typically uh, run into dealing with uh, beekeepers. And the, as we had mentioned earlier, this is the referred to as the Langstroth hive with the movable frame hive. And uh, this hive is a, of, of French design and that's a, called the Were hive. And this, we just looked at the previous picture is a type of top bar hive. And the materials needed to build a top bar hive can be anything. And so that's why in third world countries, this is probably the, the more common style of beekeeping or beekeeping box that they use because you can use many raw materials and uh, it's pretty cost effective uh, to make versus uh, this Langstroth hive. And this is another type of hive, uh, a Lysen hive, which is starting to be more familiar in Connecticut. It's a lot bigger hive than this box here. This picture doesn't represent that, but it's probably twice the size of this Langstroth box. And as you can see, the wood is really thick and that's a real thick piece of wood and this is not. And so uh, some people feel that this style of box would be more appropriate for our colder uh, winter season, provide more insulation for the bees. And so we're seeing uh, more of those types of hives. And I have each of these types of hives at various places that I play with. And so beekeeping is a, a worldwide thing. And uh, we're amazed at uh, how some of the honeybees, based upon what continent they ended up on and where they're at and how environmental influences change their development and behavior, uh, the size of the bees, is, bees changed. Uh, and some other, you know, where the bees live. And so they live in trees and they live in logs and they live in removable frame hives and they live in clay pots. And uh, it's a very good um, economy for third world developing countries. They can get additional incomes to uh, support themselves. And um, that's very uh, productive. And Morden Day, and this is, uh, I forget where this picture is. It's, a, um, I believe, a cathedral in France. And so you can see beehives on the roof. And so we're getting pretty, pretty creative on uh, where we put these uh, hives today. This hive here is in a log. That's a log hive. And it's hanging from this log in a tree. And it's, it's probably up 40 or 50 feet. Because in, in that area of the country, there's something called a honey badger. And that is a very ferocious uh, animal. And it, uh, it's very powerful and it loves to eat honey hives. And so it's called a honey badger and they hang it from the tree to, uh, to keep the badger from uh, eating that hive. So that's a little bit about the boxes that you see and how the bees are, uh, are kept in various places. Regardless of uh, what style or type of beehive you have, there are some common denominators here. And so the players, if you will, you have uh, worker bees and you have uh, the queen bee and you have drones. And so these are the players. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, bees are vegetarian, so they eat no meat most of the time and I'll qualify that and most of the hive by the way is an all-female workforce pretty much go women there is only about two or three percent of the uh, bee colony that are male and uh, during the uh, summer months 
spring and summer, a little bit into the fall, you'll find the, the males in the colony. Those that haven't done their job are thrown out of the hive at the end of the year and they become a food source for the ants and the birds and the spiders and all of that stuff. And so uh, it's a pretty much an all female society, except for the few drones. The queen, of course, is obviously female and is the only uh, reproductive female within the colony. And so colonies generally have one queen and uh, her main job, as I tell the little kids when I talk with them, is that she's a chicken. And she's a chicken because she uh, lays eggs all day long. And that's what she does a whole lot of, is eggs upon eggs, maybe 1,300 eggs a day. And uh, that's her primary role. And she, um, she's a chemical factory too, in that she release, releases uh, pheromones that suppress the ovary development in the other females. And uh, that helps her keep control of the hive. Um, in yesteryear, she lived about five years, probably two years uh, today. And she's certainly uh, much bigger than the, uh, than the other female worker bees. And typically female bees are not able to produce. However, if the queen becomes missing from the hive, and that hormonal re, uh, repression of the uh, ovaries does not occur, then a worker, the youngest female uh, worker bee will begin producing eggs. A typical colony uh, has anywhere from 20 to 60,000 bees. Uh, we looked earlier about this, uh, this beekeeping system here. This particular box is a lot larger than this box. And so you might get a uh, hundred thousand bees in that particular box. And so uh, you can have a lot of bees in a box. And so in the summer months, uh, life is short, busy, busy, and then they, they die. They work themselves to death. Uh, in the winter months, uh, they live a lot longer. And we can talk about that in a minute because it's pretty important when we talk about bee management. Going back to the drone, um, the drone is uh, larger than uh, a worker bee, but smaller than queen. And this is a drone picture here. And you can tell you're dealing with a drone. Three things should pop out at you. Number one, jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? The eyes are huge. And they take up 90% of the bee's head versus these worker bees. You can see they're much smaller. The other thing too, is the workhorse of the bees, the, the muscle chamber of the bees is in the thorax here. That's where most of the flight muscles and the uh, muscles for the legs reside. And you can see on this uh, drone, they're really large and he has a lot of muscles because he has to fly in competition with all the other drones because mating occurs on the wing up in the air. And so he needs to be a robust flyer for that reason. And in the course of reproduction, for a very short period of time, two or three or four seconds, he must also support the weight of the queen and himself and maintain flight. And so that's why he has this robust musculature there. And then he has a very broad abdomen. And the little kids see this fur at the end and they call it butt buzz. And so that's how they uh, determine what the, uh, the male bee is going to look like. And within this uh, chamber is, is uh, endophallix, which is used for reproduction. Uh, they mate uh, in flight uh, immediately upon uh, mating. In the process of mating, uh, there's an inversion of the endophallix uh, from the uh, abdomen. And this inversion is just evisceration of the entire uh, rear section of the male bee. And upon depositing the sperm within the uh, female, uh, he immediately dies. He flies to the ground and not flies, falls to the ground and is dead. And so it's a very violent ending and it's one and done deal. And if a uh, drone has not been successful uh, with mating, 
then they're forced out of the hive because they're uh, a resource that's no longer needed in the fall or a waste of resources and out you go and go feed the ants and the birds and, and whatever. We're just provide nitrogen into the ground. And so it's a sad, uh, a sad time of the year to see the, uh, the drones being pulled out by the workers and you know, it just has to happen and that's what they do. There is some, uh, and so the only role that the drone plays is uh, to create family cohesion. The hive would be off balance if there weren't males in the hive at some point. And so uh, there's some thought that perhaps because of their size and their massive thoracic muscles that they contribute somehow with the heat generating processes uh, of the hive. And that's really not well documented, but they eat a lot, I can tell you that. <laughs> so division of labor um, is based upon uh, the age of the bee. There's basically three phases. And uh, the, knee, the, the young female bee, when she first emerges, uh, is, a, is a nurse bee. And the first thing she does is start cleaning her cell. And she'll clean uh, other cells. And she'll eventually start feeding all the baby bees. Um, nurse bees are approximately one to 12 days, cell cleaning, feeding brood, self-grooming. And then um, you have uh, house bee duties, about 10 to 20 days. You build home or the infrastructure they use the wax for so that they can build a home and they do house cleaning and accept nectar from the foraging force and help with the storage of pollen. Uh, some are uh, assigned to undertaker duties and some guard the hive. And everyone is always concerned about uh, climate control within the hive. Um, they keep the temperature uh, at least 97 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. And so they also have to uh, not overheat. They have to have enough moisture um, in order to be successful for the brood to live. The, th the final stage of their life is foraging. These are the field bees and their job is to bring the resources home, the nectar, the pollen, the water, the plant resins. This is a bee on dandelion and these are a whole group of bees on my bird feeder. Uh, they need to bring the water into the hive so that they can dilute some of their secretions so they can dilute honey and so they can use the water as uh, air conditioning. They spread the water throughout the hive and beat their wings and they create air conditioning and cool themselves off if it's too humid or if it's too hot inside. And so uh, bees uh, start as an egg. The queen lays a lot of eggs each day and uh, the life cycle takes about 28 days for that uh, new bee to emerge in this mass here. You have nectar in this corner, which is their carbohydrate resource. Then you have their pollen, which is, you know, all their amino acids and enzymes in their protein source. And this is right near the brood with the brood where the bees need to be fed. So the nurse bees don't have to go far to get their resources from the kitchen to the dining room. And it works well. And that's what that little itty bitty egg looks like. And it's pretty small and it grows uh, up to be a really big bee. And so uh, bees, uh, start out as an egg and they go through uh, larval and pupil stages and emerge as a live adult. And that is of course of call, is called metamorphosis. And this is the development time. Uh, it's a little uh, shorter for the queen because when you need a queen, you need a queen. And when you don't need a drone and because he's so big and it requires further development, it's a little bit longer. And so a queen emerges in 16 days, a worker in 21, in a drone in 24 days. The bees can control that. These are rough averages and uh, weather can play a factor on that and other conditions in the hive, but that's generally true. We talked about uh, this a little bit. Uh, so you have uh, mostly females in this hive. Only one has uh, been mated and that's the queen. The other is the worker. And then you have uh, unfertilized eggs, which become a male. And so uh, that is the problem if you lose the queen and then one of these workers starts to, uh, because we don't have the uh, suppression hormones from the queen for the ovarial development, uh, the youngest worker, the ovaries, although they're very rudimentary, 
uh, not very many eggs in the ovarials will start to lay those eggs. And that's not a good thing. But anyways, on this picture, uh, we see a queen here. You can see she's a little bit bigger than uh, all the worker bees. She has uh, just deposited an egg into a cell and is leaving. And this was a good picture because there's a drone here too. And so we have all three casts right in this, here's the drone by the way. See those big eyes, jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? And so it's just a big bee with this big thoracic area and then the queen. And so that's what they look like. Uh, this is a uh, brood. So this is bees in the pupil development uh, stage and uh, drones, because they're bigger, they're usually off to the side and on the bottoms or in these areas. And the, the cells have to be bigger because the drone is bigger. And so they need a bigger cell to uh, raise a drone. And so these are all female and that's brood and that's in the pupil stage. And we talked about uh, queen workers versus queens. You can see all these eggs on this picture. Look at all those eggs that that queen does. She is truly a chicken. And uh, these, uh, the queen and the bees in their first three days of life are, felt, are fed jelly, royal jelly. So protein uh, substance from the hypotheringeal gland and they get the protein and amino acids from the uh, pollen. And the queen will eat that her whole life. That's what gives her her longevity. All bees eat this for the first three days, and then they get a mixture of royal jelly, uh, honey, and uh, pollen, or at that point, it's really called bee bread because they add some enzymes and change the, the uh, components a little bit. And so generally, you only have uh, one queen unless they swarm. I mentioned earlier the bees are, uh, are called eusocial, uh, just like you know we are, and you have. Uh, and part of that e-social status is because uh, you have division of neighbor, uh, labor, you only have uh, one reproductive uh, female member and you have a sharing of duties. And, and so the hive on a social level reproduces through a process called swarming, binary fusion, I guess. You have uh, a hive and half the bees leave with the original queen and they start a new hive in a tree somewhere. And the remaining bees uh, are, are home and they were left with a queen cell in development. And we'll look at one of the, what one of those cells look like in just a minute. Beekeepers sometimes make mistakes or the queen gets sick or injured and the bees will supersede her. Um, they'll just take the youngest uh, larva and uh, put it on a queen, queen, a queen diet and make her into a queen, but she won't be as efficient. Uh, as a regular queen, but it serves the purpose if you have no other option in nature. And then you have emergency queens. So those are the three situations by which you might have, you know, queens being replaced or, or new queens. This is a queen cell. You can see it's much bigger. And you can see the, uh, the queen pupa here and they're feeding it and taking care of it. And they feed large amounts of your royal jelly and that's all she'll get for her whole life. Uh, when this reproductive action occurs, which is called swarming, the old queen leaves with half the bees and they form a swarm. The old queen can't fly very well because she's a egg layer all day long, big abdomen. And so the bees who really rule the roost, not the queen, uh, know that the queen is gonna have to fly. And so they put her on a restrictive diet they harass her, they get her into flying shape. And uh, when she flies away for that first flight, this will be the, only the second time that she has flown. The first time was way back when she was a virgin and went on her mating flight. So the second flight is like, oh my God, I don't know if I can make it. And she just lands somewhere. And when she lands, all the bees just swarm around her to protect her. And then uh, hopefully she'll get her breath, uh, rest for a day or two and then the swarm will relocate to uh, a new home. And it's a wonderful process. I don't do justice in this few seconds talking about this process. It's truly a, a wonderful process. If you want a reading source for it, uh, the book is called Honey Bee Democracy by Dr. Dom C Tom Seeley out of Cornell University. 
And uh, he has studied this for 20 years. And it's just amazing how they do this, how these bees vote, how they decide where their new home is going to be and how they get there, having never been there before. Truly a very good read. And so uh, this is uh, what a queen cell would look like inside the hive. I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, the drones within a colony will not mate with the queen from her own colony. And so that doesn't happen. And if it was an oops and the egg is laying, the worker bees are able to sense that and then they just uh, consume the egg. And, and so that accident is not uh, allowed to happen. One very interesting thing about uh, queens is that sometimes when the, uh, the hive is going to swarm, that's a natural reproductive function of a social organism, uh, they could have more than one queen uh, laid and ready to, uh, to take on that process. And so uh, there is a way by which queens communicate with one another in the cell. It's a process of making noise and it's called piping and they uh, vibrate their uh, wings and, and, and thorax against the cell wall and they can make music. And what they're really doing is they're uh, locating where the other queens are. So the first queen that comes out will start quacking. And the other queens that are still inside the cell are gonna say, oh, there's my sister, I'm here, I'm here. And they'll start making uh, a quacking noise. And that's probably not a good thing because uh, a queen bee has a stinger. Uh, a queen bee stinger is different than a worker bee. Bees, if they sting you, will die because there's a barb at the end of the stinger. It sticks in your skin, the bee flies away, the abdomen contents remain, the muscular structure and the poison sac will pulsate the venom uh, into your body and it's not a pleasant experience. It's not true with a queen. Queen has a poison sac, but does not have a barb on the stinger. So she's able to retract her stinger just like a wasp, by the way, or a yellow jacket. And so she's able to uh, create a little hole in those queen cells and kill her siblings so that she's the only one to rule the roost. And if by chance they, uh, they emerge before she's able to get over there and do that, then they have battle royale and they have a massive battle and somebody will live and somebody will die. Um, we can also change the genetics of a hive. We can put new queens in. They come in a, ch a cage and as a way to uh, behead the queen and make the hive queenless for a day or so and then introduce new genetics with a new queen. This is a queen box that would, a uh, queen cell that would go inside the box. There's a candy in the, in the end or actually on this end. That's how the queen was put in. And uh, the bees will slowly eat their way through this candy. And those two or three days that it takes that to happen, they'll get used to this, the sense of the new queen, the scent of the new queen, and, uh, and she'll be accepted. Uh, if this process uh, goes weary, like I had mentioned, that there has to be a queen, she has to be mated. And in the course of the mating process, the sperm is collected in something called a spermatheca which is a vascular uh, marble in the abdomen of the queen. And she stirs that, stores that sperm and keeps it viable for her lifetime. And uh, when she uh, is ready to lay an egg, she measures the cell with her, her antennae. And if it's a large cell, ooh, that must be a drone cell. And she'll lay an unfertilized egg, which will become a boy bee. And if it's the appropriate size for a worker, she'll say, oops, okay, I'm gonna release a few sperm with this egg and it'll develop into a a queen or a female worker. And if that process doesn't happen, the queen dies, the queen gets squished, and they don't have a cell in waiting and things go wrong, then one of these uh, females without the suppression of hormones from the queen, the rudimentary ovaries will develop and she'll be able to lay some eggs. But this is what that mess looks like. She'll, because she hasn't got the length of the abdomen, the cells are off, the eggs are laid on the sides of the cells and she really is not meant to do this and she'll lay a dozen, two dozen, three dozen eggs in one cell. It's just a mess. It's just a futile attempt for the 
hive is a, a superorganism to share its genetics with nature. And the only way left is through male bees. And so, uh, you know, some of these will uh, emerge into male bees and they'll go up and, and do mating and they'll share the genetics to the world that way. This is a frame that looks like it's hopelessly queenless. The queen is gone. Uh, a worker has uh, got her ovaries, uh, rudimentary ovaries developed and she's laying boy eggs all over the place and they'll hatch, they'll be cared for. And through the mating process, the genetics of that colony will be shared with uh, everybody else. And we talked about pheromones and dancing because I'm looking at the clock and saying, get it in gear. So we talked about pheromones. When a, a bee stings you, by the way, there's also a pheromone marker there. And so uh, the bees can sense that. So if you get stung once, uh, you need to remove the stinger and uh, wash the area where well, the other bees will smell it and sense it and come back and sting in the same area. And that is a wonderful technique that the bees have used and evolved with. And so that is how a group of bees, just these simple little old bees, can kill an oxen or a horse or a human especially if we're talking about the uh, subspecies of honeybees called Africanized honeybees, which are common in uh, Central America, uh, portions of Texas, Louisiana, and Florida, and a few other states. And bees can overwinter very well. This was some another hive that I had in East Haddam in a very bad winter that we had. And I've given them some protection and the snow is there and they're comfy and cozy and they're loving it because why do bees make honey? Oh, they make honey for humans. Wrong. They make honey as a carbohydrate source, as an energy source, as their home heating fuel, so that they can keep and maintain the temperature in that hive, regardless of the external temperature. Uh, when there are no eggs, probably around 65, 70 degrees, as, so, as soon as uh, egg laying resumes within the hive, which is usually at winter solstice, which is usually I believe in the middle of late January, the queen will start laying eggs again. And immediately when that happens, the temperature inside that hive will go up to 97 degrees Fahrenheit. They will maintain that temperature, must maintain that temperature in order for development to occur. That is amazing. That's why bees make honey. And that's why it's critical that they have honey, that the beekeepers don't harvest too much honey. And uh, that's pretty important. So we talked about uh, bees cluster in the winter. And so the bees too also have most of their muscles in their thorax. And <clears throat> they discovered like we discovered that when we were outside and we don't have a winter coat on, when we get cold, we shiver. And that shivering process generates heat. And so because the bees aren't flying in the winter time, most of the time, uh, they can use their huge flight muscles. They will vibrate them to generate heat. And because the bees have hair all over their body, they have some insulation. If they pack themselves in, they get more insulation within that cluster. And if they all vibrate and generate heat, they do a very good job of keeping the internal temperature at that hive. This says 92, but really recent research is around 97 degrees Fahrenheit when, uh, when the bees have uh, young to keep warm. And so uh, there's a cluster. And uh, this look, you have to look at this three dimensional. <clears throat> this is like a basketball cluster. The bees that are generating the most heat are on the outside. That's where the densest uh, cluster of bees are. As you get in towards the middle, the bees are not clustered ten, uh, really close together and they're not generating heat. They're just receiving the heat that is being generated by the outside core. When these bees on the outside become tired or fatigued or die, um, these bees will come and replace each other. And when they begin tired, these bees will go out and do their job here, bring these guys in, give them a break. The queen just roams around in this loosely packed area and awaits her role as an egg layer. So the uh, thermal regulation of the hive is very, very important for bees to successfully overwinter. And there's a number of things that can interfere with that. But that's not the nature of this talk. 
I get this a lot too. Do bears like honey? Winnie the Pooh loves honey. Look at, we can see that on TV all the time. Eh, not necessarily. Really, the bees want the pro, the bears want the protein. When the bears are raiding uh, a beehive, uh, going into or coming out of hibernation, it's the protein source that they really want. That's what they want to nibble on. And if they get a little sweet stuff on the side, eh, it just finishes the meal. And so bears uh, are a problem uh, with, uh, with hives and many beekeepers have their hives uh, surrounded in electric fence. Those hives that I showed you earlier back in East Haddam, uh, in that particular area of East Haddam, uh, this whole hive here was picked up and walked away, oh, way over here because all these bees were kind of upset and were stinging the bear. He brought this hive way over here. And all I got left was little pieces of wood, little splinters of wood. That entire hive was decimated. The bee just picked it up and walked it away. And that's not an easy process. That's probably 300 pounds of box material and cinder block and, and all of that stuff. And so uh, bears are good. I like bears, but not in my beehives. And we have to provide some protection. And that's usually uh, a good conversation point with beekeepers. Uh, what is beekeeping going to look like in the future? Uh, this is a, a, a sun hive, and that's pretty unique design. We're seeing a ton of solar arrays all over the place. And so what we really need with uh, these solar arrays is pollinator habitat. And so that is one really useful thing that we could do with these uh, solar arrays. And, oh, I just lost something. Anyways, the... Uh, I sit on the uh, pollinator advisory board at the ag station, along with representatives from uh, DEP and the uh, Connecticut Department of Agriculture. And uh, we just recently submitted uh, some recommendations to the state legislature. And within, there were many recommendations pertaining to pesticides and, and the like, but one section uh, talked about uh, solar arrays and solar arrays specifically built on prior agricultural land. And uh, we, we made a recommendation that the siting council would require uh, solar arrays to have some type of agricultural component uh, within that uh, solar array. And so we recognized that uh, if that land was agricultural in nature prior to the arrays, then there should be an agricultural component before that plan is approved. And that sets the plate so that when this system ends its life expectancy, I think it's 30 years, maybe around 30 years, these solar arrays have to be removed and uh, uh, land returned to uh, its agricultural condition. And so uh, pollinator habitat is certainly a, a big recommendation. Um, I have talked with beekeepers who are actually keeping bees on in solar arrays so this is exciting there's you could put goats out there you could put pollinator habitat you could put bees there are a number of agricultural uses that you could uh, use that property for the worst thing i saw in a community not long ago was a solar array put in a parking lot and it still looked like a parking lot with all those arrays on it and very very disappointed with that but anyways i digress uh, the other thing we're going to see a whole lot more of, as we lose our habitat, uh, and as we build uh, more buildings and condos and, and retirement homes, and we're losing uh, bee forage, we're losing agricultural forage. And so we're going to see more bees being kept on rooftops. And rooftop beekeeping in New York City is very popular, especially around Central Park. We keep bees on rooftops or on sheds, on the roofs. And we're just seeing a lot more of it. I, I have uh, expected, inspected some hives in New Haven on rooftops. Uh, not very fond of that. Uh, it's something about heights and bees and whatever. And so uh, there are special considerations when you have, uh, oh, that was what I did. Um, brings back to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in uh, New Haven. Uh, had bees up on their roof and pre-COVID. Uh, during COVID, uh, the chef transferred out and he was maintaining the bees. 
and those colonies were left up there and I had to relocate them off the uh, rooftop. Um, and so that was a sad, it was sad taking them off the rooftop, but uh, I'm gonna make arrangements for the hives to be replaced with a beekeeper so that we don't have problems. So that's another thing I do. If somebody has a problem with bees, like in this case, the hives were abandoned, you know, give me a call and we'll take care of it. So, but anyways, rooftop beekeeping is very popular. I see it often in Connecticut, in New Haven, in New Britain, uh, in Hartford. And so that's one of the things in the future. So uh, I have only talked about honeybees and a little bit earlier about other bees, but there are a lot of pollinators out there. And pollinator habitat is important for all of our hummingbirds, our butterflies, our moths, our beetles, our flies, and all of those creatures. And so uh, we're constantly, you know, thinking about these things at the ag station. And so we have uh, a lot of pollination, pollinator information at the uh, website. And I don't know, oh, it is gonna allow me to go. So we're taking a trip right now, we're taking a field trip. And we're going to the Connecticut Agricultural Station's website. And you can see we're going to go down to, oh, there's my name. Click that and send me an email. And if we go down to uh, publications and we scroll down to, I probably should put my glasses on if I want to see this stuff. Sorry. And um, there you go, look at this right there, pollinator information, you double click it and you're gonna see that slide that I just showed you, but we're actually on the website and you have all of these information, all this information about bees and pollination and planting pollinator and native bees and some research that we've done and other websites that you can go to and just all kinds of wonderful things about plants and pollination and the pollinator health law is there and good stuff so it's a good place to go for additional resources and uh you know take the time and, and go visit and uh, i think you'll have a fun time there and I'm so pleased that that link worked. And so this is uh, Tracy, who uh, works. Uh, she really has a lot of information and has done extensive research on native bees. And, uh, and she's with us at the Ag Station. I work with her often. And um, she, in fact, she was just promoted up to uh, agricultural assistant scientist. And so she's done really well. And so she's a good source of information. And she would be on that contact list that I showed you earlier. The other thing that I really wanted to talk about a little bit is about uh, straw bale gardening. And so I'm often asked, well, what, I don't want to keep bees. What can I do to help pollinators? Or, and I rediscovered this thing about straw bale gardening. And so I do have a talk that I give, and I've given a couple, three this year already, about using straw bales to uh, create either vegetable gardens or pollinator habitat. And I really started uh, movement in this area because we were talking, or I was thinking about windbreaks and I wanted to protect hives in open fields from the winds of winter and the snow drifting. And so I wanted to, and I did put straw bales around the perimeter of my hives. And then in spring, I now got to move these hail, uh, straw bales away. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they are really heavy. And they froze all winter and that's what made them a good uh, windbreak uh, for the bees. And so I said, what else can I do with these? And so I rediscovered something called straw bale gardening. So I can provide pollinator habitat. I could provide habitat for the bees or I could grow vegetables just using uh, these straw bales. And I'm like, wow. And so because these straw bales, because I'm involved with a project with the VA and developing beekeeping and beekeeping systems for uh, disabled veterans, I'm like, wow, we could also do gardening. 
And so uh, part of that program is creating pollinator habitat for the bees or for anybody using straw bales. And the handicapped folks, those that are in wheelchairs or, or older people uh, who can't lift or don't want to toil the soil or only have a, a asphalt parking lot to play with, you can use straw bales. That's a wonderful thing. So I have a whole talk in, on that. And uh, it's very productive. And it's just a new thing that we can do. If you don't like the design, change it next year. If you can't uh, till the soil, don't. If your soil is contaminated, don't. Uh, just use straw bales and you can do a lot of wonderful things. And if you're a handicapped uh, gardener, you can roll up with your wheelchair right to the side and you can harvest your crop. If you've planted potatoes or, uh, or carrots, you can just pull the bale across and uh, harvest right from your seat. And it's just a good thing. And you can grow this garden anywhere. And so uh, I encourage you to look at that. Think about that. So if you don't want to keep bees, you know, grow pollinated habitat. And this is one way you can grow pollinated habitat anywhere. And so uh, again, my name is Mark. Uh, there's my contact information. This is a school that I helped establish an apiary program with. And uh, it's great working with the kids in the high schools, learning about bees, learning about agriculture, learning about wonderful things. And uh, questions, email me, call me. And I think I went over a little bit, I think. But uh, thank you for listening to me, Yibri Aber. And uh, if you should have some questions, perhaps we can answer a few. Well, thank you, Mark. That was really great. Learned a lot more about bees than I knew before. Um, we do have some questions. So I, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I will uh, ask you the questions. Let's see. Okay. So we have a few. And if anybody else has a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll make sure that uh, Mark can answer it for you, okay? So I'm gonna start from the beginning. So Mary writes, she says, I was given a Mason bee house for Christmas. What should I, where should I hang it? And are there Mason bees in this area or should I order some? Well, there are some Mason bees around, absolutely. And you could put the Mason bee hive out and, uh, I don't know if you've got the uh, materials that go inside where the bees can enter and lay their, their eggs and make their nest. Uh, sometimes you just get the box, but sometimes you need the straws, like they look like straw pieces that you put in and uh, put them out there. If, uh, if you have native uh, mason bees in the area, they'll occupy that box and you're good to go. If you don't find that to be true, uh, next year, uh, probably in February, March, you can order them online you can order the tubes that go into the box. And then when it's, uh, the weather is appropriate, you can just preload those uh, tubes in and the bees will emerge and you'll have uh, mason bees. I just did a program with the high school up north and we made two of those hives to put out. So uh, do mason bees produce honey? No. No, okay, so they're just... No. Okay, so they're pollinator bees. Yes, and uh, the, the person that uh, really has great knowledge on mason bees would be uh, Tracy Zarillo at the Ag Station, the picture of the young lady that I showed you. Okay, right. Okay, here's another question from Jan. She wants to know, uh, can you walk around the Griswold Farm CAES property? Um, I enjoy seeing the plants and ID signs at the CAES in Windsor used to, to help plant uh, my ID for my master gardener's test. So she basically wants to know, can she walk around those areas? Those so all Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station properties are open to the public, generally eight to five, uh, Monday through Friday. I only ask that you check in with the, uh, the farm staff that are there, just in case we've done some pesticide spraying or something. Those areas would be appropriately marked and all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, our properties are open 24 seven to our residents, not 24 seven, but okay, Monday through you. Friday, eight to five, or mm -hmm. on special events, I, you know, bring people to Lockwood Farm all the time. 
great. Okay. We have a wonderful but butterfly garden at uh, Lockwood Farm, by the way, in Hamden. Okay, that's good to know. Well, here's another question from Jan, and she wants to know, will there be enough pollen and nectar for bees in an urban area for bees to have a rooftop hives? And would the number of hives have to be limited? So a uh, couple of good questions there. Uh, first of all, um, good question about pollen. And so a typical hive consumes approximately 60 to 80 pounds of honey, I'm sorry, pollen a year. That's a lot of pollen, <laughs> lots of it. And so uh, that is a, a concern for two reasons, and I hope to remember these things. Uh, first, uh, quick answers, I guess. Around Central Park, there's a lot of beekeepers that have bees on the roof. They do a wonderful job and there's plenty of pollen resources in that area. As a beekeeper, we have to acknowledge that and we want to uh, evaluate uh, our hive so that we have proper nutrition available. I'll give you one quickie on this. Um, look up a study, uh, I read this a couple of three years ago in Yale 360, and they were talking about uh, pollen and protein in pollen. And there was a study in which uh, they, this group was able to get pollen over a hundred years. And this was goldenrod pollen, by the way. And they were able to do two things. They wanted to know the protein pollen protein content of pollen today versus yesteryear. And they wanted to know if there was a relation, relationship between CO2 in the atmosphere and the protein content of pollen today. And they found that, uh, oh, there is a relationship here. As the CO2 in the atmosphere increases, the protein content of pollen decreases. And in that limited look with goldenrod pollen, it was 30%. So that's, that should be an eye opener. I then, uh, two years ago, perhaps it was, read a study uh, doing the same type of analysis using um, world grain uh, rice, and they found uh, the same type of relationship, and that was a 10% decrease in the protein content of rice over time. So that would concern me. And so even if you have uh, adequate uh, uh, pollinator habitat, there are ways that we can look at the nutritional uh, factors in the hive, and at times we would have to supplement that. Okay, well, thank you for that. And let me go move on to this question from Shirley. She wants to know, uh, why do you not put insulation on hives for winter? Why not put insulation on hives for winter? That's a question. <laughs> well, that's a good question because a lot of people do put insulation on hives during winter. In fact, some people even bring their uh, hives uh, inside and store them in potato cellars or, or, other, uh, or other buildings. And so, uh, first of all, bees do fly over winter and they have to go pate sometimes. And on a good day, sun is out, 45 degrees, the bees will fly. And so we don't want to uh, uh, stop them from doing that because we don't want dysentery to develop in the hive. Um, Bees are very healthy bees, are very able to generate all the heat that they need to survive any winter. And so I go back to the very first slides of the presentation. How long have the bees been on this earth? How did they survive all these years? They have the secret. As long as we provide them the appropriate resources and maintain that the bees are healthy, uh, they'll survive quite well. Uh, the most that I do is put a piece of black tar paper around my hives. The only reason why I do that, well, I do two. Everything I do is for two reasons. If it's one reason, it's just not cost effective. And so I put tar paper around the hive, one, to serve as a little bit of a windbreak so that the breeze aren't going through the cracks of the wood and there might be punky wood, there might be a crack, there might be a piece of wood. So it further helps decrease the breeze, if you will, through the hive. And two, the black material in the winter during a sunny day will give the bees another one or two degrees of uh, heat in the hive, just to, as a little help. Uh, research that I have seen shows that bees uh, do quite well in temperatures at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So as long as the bees are healthy and of sufficient population, they can generally uh, generate all the heat they need and they've been doing it for millions of years. Mm. 
Oh, that's good. You got to, um, besides the other part of that equation. Yes. Is in order to generate the heat, what's the fuel source? It's the fuel honey. source is honey. honey. So if a beekeeper takes too much honey, or for whatever reason, there's not enough carbohydrate in the hive, they won't be able to generate heat. They won't be able to thermoregulate. So, you know, beekeepers so need to watch it, that. What uh, approximately, when do they stop taking honey from the hive then? How much can they take? Probably and in how November. Much can they take? Depends on, it depends on the uh, time of year and what's going on. Uh, People feed bees up into November. We'll look at the weather when it's the first and second frost and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, the bees can tell us and beekeepers uh, should know the art of feeding bees. And if they don't, they can call me. Okay, that's a good point. So here's a question from Susan. She wants to know, should we postpone cutting lawn grass into late spring in order to help the pollinators? Would it help the bees by allowing our lawns to grow naturally and not do that first mow until say June 1st or July 1st? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> I love that question. So from the perspective of a bee, what is that uh, nice green grass in front of your house? A uh, desert, it's right. nothing to them. Well, not nothing, a little carried away there. They can get water and dew and moisture from that grass. But generally, in a bee's, from a bee's per perspective, it's a wasteland. And so if you by chance should have things that bloom in, for example, dandelions, those are good early year protein sources for pollinators. And so when my dear wife told me uh, several years ago that she wanted to remove all the grass in my front yard, I said, you're Looney Tunes. And, and we did it. And my front yard has no grass, very little grass, and it's beautiful. And so that's the quick answer to that. Don't okay. mow, let it go. And uh, when it's no longer, when it starts to butt up like that, cut it down. I have a lot of dandelions, so I just leave them up and then... Dandelions are great for a number of reasons. They're a great first protein source for the bees. Uh, dandelion wine is good. Dandelion greens are even better. Mm. Put them in the pot and eat them. That's right. So here's a question from Dave. It's really more about a different kind of bee. He, he says, other than making holes in your eaves, what do carpenter bees do? And how can you get them to avoid your eaves and not eat, put holes into your wood? Well, I've been told, and uh, my expertise is not carpenter bees, but I've been told that usually the carpenter bees are a good sign of uh, wood that's starting to decay a little bit, and that's why they're picking on it. And so, uh, you know, give them some, something to nest on that's appropriate. Uh, if you have a, a, a tree in your backyard or a stump, put a lot of holes in it, encourage them to relocate to that area. If you're going to have a, a tree harvested in your backyard or on your property, consider having it uh, cut down and, uh, you know, keep it up six feet, top it, put a bird feeder up there, drill a lot of holes in it and make it into wildlife habitat. Oh, that's a great idea. Okay, excellent. And I'm going to finish off with this last question by Jan. Is there a way to make or choose pollinator plants that have more protein and are better for them? I assume for the bees. Oh, I love the, I love the question there, that's for sure. And so uh, everything in nature evolves around diversity. Nature has proven itself that if we have diversity, we can have success over many millions of years. And so we need multiple uh, pollen sources uh, to get the trace minerals and amino acids and all of that stuff. And so uh, there are different bees have different preferences, for example. So you have a squash bee who really depend only on the squash. The honeybee is a more of a generalist and they're going to pollinate a lot of different types of crops. You have a blueberry bee that specifically does blueberries. And so um, for those generalist bees, um, you know, we want to provide a variety of uh, pollen sources for them and let them choose. And what they don't like, somebody else is going to like it. 
and it'll probably look good at the same time. Look at all the places in our landscape environment. Look at the roadways, the right of ways, the power lines, all of these places where we can plant habitat. Oh, we just need to be doing a better job with that. DOT on the state level, uh, we have been communicating or Dr. Kim Stoner has been interacting with them for at least the last three years. And we have pollinator corridors now. Uh, we're allowing large, vast sections of, uh, uh, I guess they call them strips in between highways. Uh, mm -hmm. We let them, uh, the pollinator stuff grow and not mow it late into the year. And so everyone needs to do more of that. Um, diverse pollinator <laughs> habitat. And uh, if you're planting pollinator habitat, make sure you have successional plantings early season, uh, late spring, summer, early fall, late fall. And so there's always something around for our, uh, our pollinators to uh, have a snack. That's great, Mark. Um, I know in our town, um, the spring bulbs are starting to come up and um, I'm part of a group that we try to have pollinators going all the time. And we hope in our community of Bloomfield that people will stop by and look on our town green at our pollinators and elsewhere in our public parks and gather inspiration from that and take it back to their own homes and plant, because this is the time now. Pretty soon the nurseries will be having lots of plants for you to go uh, purchase. And uh, we hope you do and bring many bees to your property. Um, thank you so much.